I hate that mug, Erin. What does the mug say? What is it? It says, I love you, California. Um, oh. We need to send Erin a different mug. Yeah, we do. OK, we're live, guys. Go ahead and get started. Hey, excellent. Welcome, everyone. Uh, happy Tuesday to you all. Emily Williams Knight here with the TRA. We've got Kelsey, Eric, and Stryfer, who you also know as well. Um, Joe Monastero and Anna from our team are behind the scenes helping to set this up, but also fielding questions. And then I'm obviously thrilled today that we have Aaron Frazier from our National Restaurant Association team with us. Um, I think I mentioned this a lot, uh, you know, when you join us as members here, whether you're in downtown Dallas or Austin or somewhere else, you sort of get that local, the state, but also this federal reach. And, you know, Aaron knows this. I called it out yesterday, but I, I just can't say enough about the work that he's done uh, specifically for us on this deductibility issue, which if you haven't done your taxes yet or even done a quick assessment um, is really going to be a huge help for all of you. And so um, the sort of the, the guardrails today are that this is a 5,000 page bill. <laughs> We've had about 15 hours, Aaron, to look at the text. Uh, their team has been up pretty much all night reading through. We've got a great document we're going to walk you through um, today to sort of give you the what I would call the, the high points, the most important things you need to know. Um, we're going to answer any questions that we can, but just like when the first round came, um, we're not your tax experts or lawyers. And I say that because none of this is legal advice that you want to run with, but really the guidance I think that you need. Just like before, we will start to walk through this with you, start to provide all the information as the Treasury SBA starts to make the rules and guidelines that support this legislation, and those start to come out. Our national team, again, will push those out right away and we'll help digest them with all of you um, and help you walk through the process. You know, before we get into the details, this is a really important point. This is a very good piece of legislation that we got at the 11th hour. You all know we've been lobbying for this since May. The pandemic went far longer than we ever expected. And we've been working really hard. And I have to say two things. One, our elected officials, our senators and congressmen and women did an exceptional job on our behalf. Uh, many of them were out in front leading legislation to help us. That's a very good thing. The relationship that we have had as an association and our National Russian Association partners and all of you in the grassroots and the hundreds of thousands of letters that made it impossible for Congress to go home without doing anything. All of that comes from when you collectively put voices together, it's very hard to ignore. So my assessment of this is this is a great start to hopefully a more expansive recovery bill in the new year. But right now, getting deductibility, getting a second round of PP with more favorable terms, many other things you don't even know yet that are in here we'll walk through today um, is something to celebrate. And I don't want to lose that moment because we didn't get a comprehensive just for restaurants package. There's a couple of nods in here to restaurants, which I think you're going to like a lot. And if you know us at all, we're already going to be back in the new year lobbying for even more relief. So overall, we think this is a really good win for restaurants and we're going to celebrate that. So as I pull my screen up, I don't know if Kelsey or Aaron want to make any opening comments at all. Kelsey, do you want to jump in? Sure. I'll just dive in briefly and say I'm really proud of our team, and that includes every single restaurant operator, every single employee, every single customer, um, and of course, our national team, Aaron especially. Um, this didn't happen by accident. It didn't happen spontaneously. It happened because we had a sustained and really strategic um, plan to get this over the line. And when I look at you know, our, our sort of wish list, the things we've been asking for from Congress for months, as Emily said, so many of those are in this bill. And that's because of the hard work of all of you, Aaron, and the rest of our state and national team. So I'm proud. I think once again, Texas really led on a lot of these things, whether that's deductibility um, and a lot of these pieces. So yay us, let's celebrate the moment. Let's uh, take advantage of every single piece of this that we can. And as Emily said, you know, we'll be back uh, hitting the ground hard uh, in the new year to ask for more because we know we need more. Excellent. All right, Erin, I'm going to sort of do this with you and Kelsey. And what I'm going to do is I thought it'd be great. The National Russian Association team last night came out with, I just think, a great three pager um, that we are going to circulate to our entire distribution list when this is over. But I thought it'd be really good context to actually walk through each piece on my screen as we um, work through it. We've gotten a couple of questions overnight that we'll try to surface in. I know, Aaron, we've sent those to you as well. Some we have answers to, some we don't. Uh, they're too technical or we don't have the guidance yet. But to kick it off, we'll start with the 
Paycheck Protection Program, the first nod to restaurants is instead of two and a half times uh, your payroll that uh, other sectors have received, the restaurant industry, that restaurant and food service accommodation code, I think it's code 72, Aaron, um, has received three and a half times. Um, there's a number of details that we can walk through. And Aaron, I'll kind of turn this piece over to you because I think the 500 down to 300 uh, is one thing we want to talk about. And then also sort of the expansion of what we can use PPP for. Yeah, and, and Emily, thank you very much. That was an excellent framing of, of where we are. <clears throat> but just to underscore what Emily and Kelsey were saying, uh, we aren't where we are this morning without Texas restaurants. And uh, I, I might be underdressed for a Zoom webinar, but I'm wearing a Texas barbecue restaurant t-shirt um, because I, I personally and professionally am so thankful for all the efforts that you and your team and uh, restaurants big and small have done in Texas. Uh, just to give you a little, and there's a lot to unpack over the next two weeks to two months, right? And there's going to be time to do that. And we'll, we will make ourselves available to, to do that. But I want to do a little context and do a real quick time snapshot of where we were in June of this year. And that's as, as you know, a lot of uh, cases were respiking in Texas and there were more closures. And that we realized that summer wasn't going to end the COVID economy for restaurants. Uh, <clears throat> one of the first things we did is we made the first round of PPP more workable. We wanted to ensure that your forgiveness was going to be maintained, even though you couldn't rehire all your employees. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the payroll, that, that the utilities, uh, because our payroll wasn't the same thing as we thought it was going to be. Uh, we gave more time. PPP is not an eight-week process when you get these funds. We need up to 24 weeks to get it, to, to spend these funds. And because of, again, Texas Restaurant Association and, and Texas restaurants, uh, this effort was introduced in the House in May and, and signed into law the first week of June. Uh, but by June and July, we were realizing this isn't, you know, this isn't a 10-week problem of, of PPP loan funds. This is a much deeper problem. And we were starting to get proposals that said, hey, the threshold, if we have an, a second draw of PPP, let's make it at 50% gross receipts loss. And we went right to Texas Restaurant Association and said, what do you think about 50%? And members were saying, uh, I'm at 32 and I'm barely hanging on. I've lost 28% and I'm barely hanging on. Uh, and we took that data and we pushed back hard for a second draw of PPP. And it went from 50% to 35%. And then today to be eligible for a second round of PPP, the loss threshold over a calendar quarter is at 25%. And from our data, that means the vast majority of restaurants, uh, particularly the, the independent operators, the smaller operators, will be able to qualify for a second draw of PPP under that formula. As Emily mentioned, the, the amount of money was also pretty low. We have a very different payroll than we did in 2019. So you have two options to calculate what your PPP loan amount for a second draw would be. The first option is you can go back to 2019 and say, what was my average monthly payroll? It might be a little bit bigger than the payroll you have now, but I think I can stretch that over my 24 weeks to get that, that loan amount. Or you might say, this is a very, there, there's so much uncertainty with what's going on in my restaurant and my community. We're gonna take a loan that's more accurate to what we saw the past 12 months in terms of business of, two, of 2020. And our payroll is probably going to be more similar to 2020 than it was in 2019. So your calculation for your PPP second draw loan amount would be the 12 months before the loan origination, your average monthly payroll 20, 12 months before your loan origination. That's going to be a smaller amount. Very few restaurants added staff. Most of them are down payroll, as you know. Um, so th that's the way you could calculate your eligibility for a second round of PPP. Uh, as, Emily, as Emily mentioned, there are some new ways that you can spend your PPP amount. Uh, a couple of the new categories of spending that are available are, sorry, I just wanna make sure I get them right. And I'm gonna go to the same place that uh, the screen is going. Uh, <clears throat> personal protective equipment. That's your masks, your there gloves. We go really anything that's recommended by the CDC or OSHA or 
uh, the the uh, the Texas agency that that asks people to uh, to wear protective equipment. You, that is going to be an eligible expense, and that's backdated into March of 2020. Uh, other cleaning products and services that you have, reconfiguration of your spaces to enable social distancing, supplier costs like perishable goods. <clears throat> and again, that goes back into 2020. And there's also a big one that I need to add to this chart that I checked on late last night. And that's the technology investment that you had to make, cloud computing, software, et cetera. And for us, we push for that because we know so many restaurants have had to build on the fly really good tech in order to enable pickup, carry out delivery services. Either your own tech or you had to boost up your own software, your own programming to meet the tech uh, specifications of other third party delivery vendors. So that, that we think is a big thing because not every restaurant, not every community uh, has had to invest in that type of technology for people to access your restaurant. So I'm gonna stop there and see if there are any questions on kind of the loan calculation and the eligibility uh, for, for those new expenses. And let me say, I'm sorry, before I forget, those are all in the non-payroll category. So the structure for, for loan forgiveness is 60% on payroll, that's paychecks, group health insurance benefits, any retirement uh, savings accounts, and then the 40% is on non-payroll, rent, utilities, mortgage interest payments, and now you can add a couple other things like supplier costs, technology, and cleaning supplies. And Aaron, one of the questions I see here in the box is, do supplier costs include all F and B cost of goods sold that they lost, that inventory? It, it, so it should be perishable goods. Yep. That, that's the, the actual language from the bill is perishable goods. Now they haven't defined it down to the F and B category. Uh, but if you, if, if someone wants to recommend what that language should be, like how are we going to cover food and beverage inventory costs to ensure that that's included in perishable goods, I would love to see that recommendation. You know, a, a lot it's of these folks are going to provide looking. guidance, right? SBA will have to provide guidance of the exact definition. Because that is a forgivable cost, that yeah. is going to come likely from SBA, who is going to re-release forgiveness guidelines through regulations over the next two weeks. Okay, so that's something we can actually work on as a team, right, Aaron, too? It is. Absolutely, yes. Submit. So if anyone yeah. on this also has a suggestion that would make it where you could, because that's one of the, you know, the thing no one understands is that, especially when we go up and down in our volumes or curfews get slapped on restaurants, this is all obviously far outside of Texas as well, you lose all the inventory. And many of these people have lost their inventory four, five, six times you know, these costs. And so I think that's something we can factor in and we can work on. Also, Sharon, um, hey, Sharon, says, which payroll current or comparable time last year? Which payroll? So that's the 12th. So the, the payroll calculation for your loan amount would be either 2019, your average monthly payroll in 2019, or it would be calculated from 12 months before your loan origination for your second PPP loan. So those are the two... Two choices Timelines you can use. Yep, and I've got, let me move. I realize I'm sharing my screen so you guys can all probably see this chat box, but you can see right here, this is the, this is the two options, right, Aaron? Those and, are I, and I put it in the chat box as well, so folks can grab yes. it from there too. Perfect, and then what is the reporting period for forgiveness in round one? It was eight or 24 weeks. It's the exact same thing in round two. Yes, you can, you can choose because of the PPP Flexibility Act that we worked with TRA to pass in May and sign into law in June. You can choose either an eight week period to spend all of your PPP loan funds, or you can choose a 24 week period for the same thing. Got it. Okay. And then does this apply to owning multiple locations, assuming all locations have less than 300 employees? Yes. So that's a shift, right? From 500 to 300. Right. So we worked really hard to ensure that we had the per physical location threshold for the employee cap, because restaurants don't operate like other businesses where you have you know, 400 employees all in one location. So what we did was we, we maintained the structure so that restaurants would have enhanced access by saying that it's 300 employees per physical location. And we also included that affiliation waiver from SBA that allowed like franchisees to still access PPP funds, 
because they're separate businesses. Yes, they have the same logo, but they're separate businesses as, as folks on this phone call know. Excellent. And then the, is it the same 24 week period or a separate 24 week period? So let's say you borrowed in round one and you measured against a 24 week period. It's a new 24 week period. You can carry this over for. It is a new, so yeah, so round one ends, right? And I, I'm guessing that 90, 98% of PPP round one participants have wound down their 24 week period. Yes. Then you would get a new 24 week period that would start when you get your second draw from PPP. Okay, does that make sense? I hope so, it's Scott Anderson, okay. Okay, now I just wanna dive into the tax deductibility structure again. It's something that, that Texas restaurants uniquely both educated us on uh, very early. And then uh, Emily took it to the highest levels of the federal government. And, um, and then she and, then she and, and the restaurants rolled this person that was very against it. So I just want to tell that story real quick. I don't think we have to tell that story. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, no so, I, mean, I think uh, you, all, you all know, right? We, we, this is something that I've been crazy about because in many cases, you all took your PPP loans and kept employees on the books, which was the intention. You weren't generating revenue. And then you couldn't actually deduct those expenses as ordinary business expenses. And so your tax bill would have increased. Um, that's wrong on every front. It's just wrong. And it wasn't the intention of the legislation. And so um, our uh, head of government affairs for national and our CEO and I got on a call with the secretary of the treasury um, to say it was unpleasant would be an understatement. Um, he was very set in his ways that he really believed in his position. And so we then had his exact words were, if you remember, Aaron, we shared after the call was then go get Congress to make the fix. And so that's what we did. And we had our own Senator Cornyn actually create the language um, uh, to fix this, but, but I don't want you to underestimate. And it's interesting as people are starting to calculate this now, Aaron, in the last 24 hours, they're realizing what this advantage really is. And so if you can walk through the deductibility, but just know this is a very important thing to me personally, because it's almost offensive what was going to happen to restaurants. But, you know, I think it's, it's a huge win because it was the 11th hour. And I mean, the 11th hour is like three o'clock on Sunday when this finally cleared and he finally backed down. Um, and so it was a group effort, my colleagues across the U.S., but for us, for you all, this is significant. Right. And, and, and just to back up a little bit, and, and folks on the, on the call, especially those who have a green eye shade, know that traditionally your payroll, your utilities, your rent, these are all considered ordinary and necessary tax deductions. Uh, you shouldn't have to pay a tax on that kind of, on those kinds of expenses. And when the CARES Act was written and when the, the, all the different people on the Hill were writing this, they said, we want this money, this emergency small business PPP loan to be like invisible money. We don't want to tax it. It's going to go to employees. It's going to go to other providers. Like, we heard it from our restaurants. We heard it like, you know, this is a pass through. This isn't a great grant program. And we said, we know, but this is the best we're going to get right now. And, and, and we're going to keep pushing in a lot of different areas. But the, the taxability was supposed to be, again, invisible money that is not going to be taxed one way or the other. And then uh, by the first, the last day of April, first week of May, the IRS put out a notice. And keep in mind, if you're thinking about that, that sounds funny. Yes, PPP opened the first week in April. So almost a month after that, we get word from the IRS, from the IRS and the Treasury Department saying, you don't get any deductions. <laughs> and what that would create is a clawback from all of your PPP loan funds. Because again, as Emily said, restaurants were closed. They weren't gonna make payroll. It's just, you were gonna have a lot of people on unemployment for six weeks to six months. Um, but instead they're gonna keep people on payroll because you're getting this emergency loan to do so. But now you're gonna come back and say that I can't take my normal deductions because of PPP and I'm gonna be out of money. You're gonna be out of almost 37% of your PPP loan amount by Q1, 2021. And so for us, we're like, this is crazy. And as Emily said, uh, Senator John Cornyn said, this is crazy. And we have to really push this and advance this in, in a smart way. And Senator Cornyn got all the major tax writing lawmakers uh, in the Senate behind the bill. Uh, we made sure we were loud and clear uh, with Senator Cornyn saying, yes, like, let us know how we can advance this issue. Um, we had real uphill battle uh, with uh, the Secretary of Treasury, 
who remarkably earlier this week said, oh, Congress restored tax deductions under PPP, so that's good for them. And we're like, well, it was your decision that denied them in the first place. But uh, <clears throat> long story short, after people from San Antonio, like La Familia Cortez and Pappas Restaurants and, and Tracy Vought, like so many great Texas restaurants said, they illustrated the issue, they made it clear, they pushed it in the house, which was actually more of an uphill battle than we thought. Uh, we, we told the story in the Houston Chronicle with Emily and, and Senator John Cornyn at a really critical time. And by the time on Sunday night, when there was a proposal floated that we're gonna chop it in half, and we're gonna say those who have smaller loan amounts can take their deductions. Bigger loan amounts, you are rejecting all of their deductions. There was, there was a riot. There was a riot, as much as you can riot on Zoom and, and conference calls. There was a riot among House members who said, that's absolutely ridiculous. Small businesses in my, in my community will close when they're trying to emerge from a pandemic, when they're trying to get a vaccine in their arm by the spring, and then they're going to get hit with a tax bill on April 15th. And uh, we, we know the story was told and it was done in a way of both illustrating the numbers and what that effect has on, on restaurants right now. And we're able to, to fix that in a comprehensive way uh, in this bill that passed last night. And again, it doesn't get done without TRA. It doesn't get done without restaurants being, um, you know, they say a, a fanatic is one that won't change their mind and refuses to change the subject. Uh, we were kind of fanatical about fixing this uh, for small businesses. And we appreciate everything y'all have done on that. And I think um, the good news, Aaron, is it's, it's for everyone to know it's for round one and round two. So, yes. so it, getting it fixed for the first round is great, but ensuring it doesn't happen again through other, you know, um, interpretation by SBA or treasury, um, I think is really good. And so now as you're working with your tax folks, this is in place. And so make sure as you're, as you're going through both your forgiveness and your taxes that this is now done and dusted. I think the president's signing it sometime today, I believe. So there's no risk there. Right, right. And, and it was, it's been, it's been very positive um, to get this through. And if anyone calls it a windfall, I mean, there are some reports, there's always going to be people from the, from the cheap seats uh, calling it one thing or the other. It was essential. It needed to be done. And, and we're happy to talk about it more. Uh, and Aaron, if I could just jump in briefly on that, I, I think that's such an important point because this was essentially a pass through grant, right? It was money that restaurants received to immediately spend to keep their employees on payroll, even if it wasn't financially beneficial to do so, to pay suppliers, to purchase PPE, right? I mean, these, these were essentially, it was essentially a pass through mechanism. So to then, after you've spent the money, because you had to spend the money quickly, to then say, we're going to claw 37% of that back. I'm, I'm sorry, if that's a windfall, then, then we're living in an alternate universe. It's just a matter of basic fairness. The point, the whole point of the program was to get these funds into restaurants' hands so they could spend them quickly. Um, so I know I just get riled up when I hear that, and I know Emily does too, so I just have to make that point that it really was just a matter of, of basic fairness. You don't claw something back after it's been spent in the exact way you said it had to be spent. <laughs> And, and, I'll, and I'll, thank you, Kelsey. I completely agree with that. It was also holding up forgiveness. Restaurants were waiting to, to, to apply for loan forgiveness. Like, you know, the anxiety that you all have, I'm sure is, is something you have on a, on a nightly basis. And, um, but the people were waiting on loan forgiveness to figure out deductions. And not only do we get deductions in this, in this final bill last night, but we got streamlined loan forgiveness. For anyone who's opened up a loan forgiveness application, it's tough. It looks like you need an accountant, a lawyer, and a priest to, to really get to navigate through it. Um, but for loans, again, of $150,000 and less, it's streamlined, simplified, one page. Did you, did you spend the money the way that we asked you to? Yes, I did. And I got, I got the gray hairs and wrinkles to prove it. And, and let me send it off to my bank. And the bank's going to say, hallelujah, we don't have to go through line by line and try to like tell you to go back to the well. Oh, how many FD, just show me your pay stubs. They're just gonna say, thank you. Let me send that back to the SBA and do it like the program was intended and get this money off our books and get that money out from the federal government. So. And what's really good here, Aaron, for everyone listening is they all know their loan size. In Texas, it's about 120,000 for our, our industry. So, you know, we have a, a very large number of people that have been dreading this application process, this forgiveness process that that overnight now, I don't think even realize it's down to really a page and a half. 
um, is what it is. And so it's, it's like, I call it the postcard plan, right? Yes, I did what I was supposed to do and you mail it in. Um, that's going to give you back hours and hours of time um, and just take another thing that's stressing you off your plate. So I think this was a big win um, as well. And the banks, I mean, this is the biggest win for the banks because I don't know how they were going to manage through forgiveness. Um, they've just done an incredible job. So I think that's a really important point too. And if you have a relationship with your lender, remind them, you know, they get stressed out. They're like, well, we don't even know if we want to do round two. Like it's, it might be stressful. It might be tough for us to even like begin round two process because it took away from their golf game. No, I'm just kidding. But you know, it's, it was tough for them to operate and they had to spend a lot of time. Uh, it takes the risk at it for them to deal Correct. with smaller restaurants who they may not have traditional banking relationships. And you're saying, no, like it's going to be easier for everyone to do this on round two. And I will say there was the, uh, for those who have the economic injury disaster loan, uh, for anyone who applied for that from SBA uh, earlier this year, you should have had an advance grant and it was up to $10,000. Some people got lower than $10,000, but originally that advance grant, again, was supposed to be invisible money and saying, here you go. We know this is a terrible pandemic. If you need uh, five to $10,000, you should be able to get it once you apply for an idle. What uh, our friends at Treasury did was they said, we're gonna deduct that amount from your overall PPP loan forgiveness eligibility. So if you were gonna get $100,000 forgiven because you did everything right, they were gonna say, oh, well, you only get $90,000 forgiven because you already got 10 grant, $10,000 from the emergency grant, which stinks because again, that's another little clawback uh, going into your loan forgiveness amount for next year. But what this bill did is it said that your idle advance grant is no longer deducted from your PPP loan forgiveness amount. Um, so that's not a lot of money that is now um, kept by, by you and your restaurant, but that's something. And we wanted to make sure that folks, especially the smaller operators knew about that. Good. So let's, Aaron, where we're on PPP, if you don't mind, can we go through these points, which is loan size, which is now 2 million. It's been reduced from the 10 million uh, cap prior. Uh, but again, the affiliation rules would play here, right? So Right. The, so the, that would be the affiliation rules by your generally your tax identification number. That was a really important distinction that we learned about in how companies are incorporated to receive the original PPP. So if you have for your affiliation threshold, you can still operate your, you can still get your $2 million. Now we've already heard from people saying, you know, is there anything to, is there a way to bump that up, especially if you have more operators that are eligible considering the per physical location size, we haven't heard anything about that. Um, and just to, you know, that's probably the, the one of the splashes of cold water is that $2 million is good, not great, especially for the larger restaurants, um, which is why Emily led this off saying, this is a down payment on where we, on the kind of relief that we really wanna seek. Um, it's not gonna be comprehensive. It's not gonna dig us out of the 2020 hole um, but that 2 million cap does look pretty firm right now. And, and it's even become an, an unfortunate political football. Any loan over $2 million for the original PPP was receiving a loan for a loan questionnaire, a loan necessity questionnaire. Um, so touching that might be a little bit of a, um, a challenge to adjust. Yeah. And then businesses we talked about is now 25%. And again, this is where lobbying matters really and and really having a loud voice in that many of you when we surveyed you if you remember i think kelsey it was probably four months ago um at 50 percent is where we were then we got to 35 and then through a lot of good work and senator rubio and others stepping up it's now at 25 percent um that was not in the original um threshold but it is far better uh than what was on the table just a couple months ago uh we talked about 300 or fewer employees it used to be 500 but again that's per location. So for some of you that have four or five restaurants, um, you certainly should come in under that threshold. Um, additionally, the uh, this one, which is eligibility size per location, this is um, restaurant and lodging secured this carve out. I think this is a really important carve out because I think it does benefit us so much. I think so many of our independent operators that have two or three location, um, and this preserves the ability or intent to adjust the figure to 300 employees rather than 500, but most single location restaurants you're still within that threshold of 300 less employees. Um, that's fair to say, right, Aaron, just on average size of restaurants. Right, right. I mean, nine, nine out of 10 in Texas have less than 50 employees. 
So I think we're going to be good there. Um, the uh, waiver restriction, it's the same waiver as before the NAICS number uh, 72, which is all of you, I'm sure, um, on this call. And then we get into um, what Aaron talked about on forgiveness. The PPB draw loans are forgivable when spent on eligible expenses. That's 60-40. The 40% we already walked through with you, which are all those other costs. I mean, one of our greatest um, frustrations is that restaurants have been act op uh, asked to operate or really forced to operate because you've got to keep your business, but you've had all these new restrictions. You've had to redo for curbside and takeout. You've had to re you know shape the front of your um, uh, to go area. You've had to buy endless cleaning supplies and masks and PPE. Now having those all in that 40% non-payroll is going to help a lot of you, I think, especially when it comes um, to forgiveness. The um, This is the question that someone asked earlier about funds must be sent with either the eight weeks or the 24 weeks. There's been no change to that. Um, Aaron talked about the deductibility pieces, um, the tax treatment. This is where we've got the deductibility now. Um, off of your taxes. I promise you, if you go now and run your taxes, you're going to be in a much better place than you were prior. Um, streamlined forgiveness, we talked about as well, which is down to that 150,000. You will simply mail in essentially a postcard. Uh, this is the um, uh, 10,000 that we, and again, some of these things, and I want to be really clear, we got guidance throughout the last nine months. So in some cases, people were operating that idle was never that 10,000 going to be taken off your forgiveness. And then a, a piece of guidance comes out and says, oh, we're so sorry. And so getting that corrected in this, again, like Aaron said, it's a small amount, but it is an amount of money. And anything right now we can piecemeal together to provide support um, is a win. And, and I would say that that's an employee's payroll for the month. You know, that's keeping someone on in February, which you, you may not be able to do unless you were able to keep that money, which we know it's so important to, to y'all. Yep. And then allowing related party rent forgiveness. This is something that also just came up I don't know, 60 days ago, Aaron, 90 days ago, it was late in the game as well, which in August is, <laughs> okay, so it was more like- Another curveball. That was close. Um, rent paid to a related party where you have your ownership and you're paying rent to a related party. So you're paying rent for someone else, but it's still part of that overall business operation. Um, they did not touch. And so Aaron, what's your sense? Because I know we've got, this was a biggie that I heard from, especially from our big operators when this hit. Um, it wasn't touched, but that's another thing that is adjusted by Treasury or SBA. Do we think it's just going to not not be touched? I'm assuming. So we we haven't had um, honestly. I don't know if folks in the SBA are uh, updating their LinkedIn profiles and and contacting other people to for uh, jobs, but we haven't heard any progress on this. We've already raised this issue with the Biden transition team in saying this particularly affects uh, family owned operators who have been told for generations, own the property that you have, hold on in a separate company. That's how you maintain your liquor license. That's how you sell beer and wine. You know, it's just, it's a, it's a smart way of having a family owned business and um, controlling risk. And then the SBA put out a rule over four months after the program opened saying that that type of rent may not be eligible for forgiveness. Operators were telling us, I would have spent it all on payroll. If I knew that, I mean, the whole issue is forgiveness. I could put it all on payroll over 24 weeks, but I did it on rent because I was told I could and no one told me I couldn't. Um, so that's an issue we wanna clarify and make sure that people aren't losing loan forgiveness because of related party rent. When you applied for your PPP loan, you listed other companies that you have an ownership interest in and that's what they might double check. So just be very cognizant of if you, so if you or one of your partners also list that they are a partial owner of the larger building where you operate, where you pay rent, um, it, it does not, it does not behoove you to, to, to not be aware of it. We just want to make sure people are aware of that because maximizing loan forgiveness is, the, is going to put us in the best spot for next year. And because this wasn't explicitly addressed in legislation, we want to also flag it for a second draw of PPP. If you are taking on a second draw, remember that your rent forgiveness might be restricted if you, you or one of your partners also owns the building and the property where you operate. Perfect. And I was going to say, that's the most important piece is let's figure out if we can make any movement. But in the meantime, on PPP round two, be thoughtful about if that's a scenario you're in, you want to think about forgiveness on payroll, right? And other expenses and not yeah. think of that. Because if not, you're going to box yourself in again. 
Yeah, and, and we have a lot more non-payroll options for round two, as you've seen, and as, as is illustrated in this document. <clears throat> so take a look at that. Be very cognizant of multiple owners in this rent forgiveness provision, because it's something that's very technical and is, was, was kind of ignored, but you can tell, like, I don't want this to slip and people to lose their rent forgiveness when they apply for forgiveness in April and May as business is getting back to normal. I'm gonna to switch to Kelsey because there's a bunch of questions in the chat, Aaron. So now we're gonna put you on the hot seat and see how many of these we can get through. <laughs> okay, so first we've had a couple of people ask if a restaurant opened in 2020 or was even you know, planning to open in 2021, um, they're not eligible for a PPP, right? Because they can't show losses from 2019. Is that right, Aaron? So the cutoff that I've seen is February 15th yep. of 2020. Because what they want to do is say, okay, you operated in January and partial of February. Show me the revenue declines from Q1 to Q2, three, four. And that revenue threshold is what they want to see. Now, how do you show a revenue threshold decline of 25% if you weren't open? You know what I mean? So it's, it's right. hard to, to attack that component of it. Um, have we seen better terms on SBA loans? We have. Do we expect idle to get some more money? Yes, but it's hard to show economic injury if you're opening a restaurant right now. Um, I think an SBA 7A loan or, an, I mean, going down the SBA loan versus the PPP, but you're right because we've had a number of restaurants open since, which we've said to them, just based on what we know, Aaron, they don't qualify. And then ones that open, like we had a couple of restaurants reach out that opened the 1st of March. And because they couldn't demonstrate a loss year over year and from the, after the first week they started losing, there was no way so as I think if you are in that January up until like February 10th time rate, time rate, it's worth trying to go to. And if not, I look at, and we'll go through, once we get through these questions on the first page here, I can go through a couple of the other changes, right? Because SBA, some of the favorable terms that have come out of this as well, we can walk through. Mm -hmm. And again, I just reiterate, this is the down payment, right? We know there's more work to do. We know there are folks who, you know, can't fully utilize all these programs. And so that's why we're going to keep, keep going back to Congress until we get what we need. Um, let's get into timeline. So first, if someone got a got a P, got PPP round one, um, do they have to reapply for a second PPP loan, or is it essentially an extension of the first one? Yeah, there, yeah that's interesting because um, I didn't I didn't think I didn't think that one would not just reapply. Uh, <clears throat> but over the last week, people were arguing about is it a plus up, like just just refill the coffers, or do we have a reapplication process because you need to prove the 25% losses mm -hmm. because the lenders need to be in on it. Um, the, the, the understanding right now and the way that we've seen the language is that there will be a reapplication process, which I know shrugs a lot of shoulder or, or lowers a lot of shoulders, but uh, it, it, I don't think it's going to be as simple in, in 21st century as giving a plus up of the money. Yeah, it is a government program. <laughs> we always have to keep that yeah. realistic. Yeah, and I think people should start thinking about those lenders now, right? We saw that I think in Texas, it was like 70% of the loans were carried by your small local banks yeah. um, versus the, the big ones. We actually had folks that were waiting with some of the biggest banks that never got through the process. So I would say right now, if you're looking at these terms and it is favorable, get in line, right? Start, I mean, it won't be till January, but have the conversation with your lender to say, I want to go through this process again to make sure you, you are not waiting until February and deciding, or the money's gone at that point, and you're deciding what to do, like really line up that lender now. Um, we're going to try to do some work in the background to find out, you know, it is very local, <laughs> you know, but yeah. if, if there are some more community regional banks that we can point you to, um, I think it's really important that you have that answer now and don't wait. Yeah, and and actually, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Nope, go ahead, Aaron. There will be lender compensation. I mean, that is detailed in, the, in this bill that uh, a lender has a tiered structure for loans up to 50 grand. The lender processing fee is give or take 2,500 bucks. For loans between $50,000 and $350,000, the lender fee is like 5%. If it's $350,000 and above, the lender fee is 3%. That's, that's not bad. I mean, oh. you're, the lender is still getting money. Streamlined forgiveness is going to help the lender. And Smaller, and this is on the fact sheet too, smaller businesses do have some more money that is specifically put aside to them. So there is, there is a positive effect for working with 
smaller restaurants, restaurants that wouldn't make that you may not lend to under traditional commercial banking circumstances. Here, here's the incentive. There's there's very little risk for the lender. They're fully guaranteed, fully federally guaranteed by the government. Um, it, it, it's it could be a win for all around. Well, and I think, Aaron, that's such an important point, and I have it up here in the middle of the screen, um, that sometime, last time we had some smaller, like right? they had a little mom and pop shop that had like eight people, nine employees, and then they went to try to get a loan and were denied. And now the restaurant industry has been decimated. So where are lenders in this? So incentivizing, I'm so glad you brought this up, incentivizing them in the process, I think will help our, you know, our, our little small coffee shops or little Thai restaurant or taco, you know, taco Rita, is it called taco Rita, I think? We have those incredible taco stands in, in, in many parts of Texas, like just little mom and pop with authentic food that we can't afford to lose. Well, now actually there is a venue for them and likely they won't just get dismissed. And I think that's really important in this piece here. So thanks for bringing that back up. And, and, and let me say this because we were all involved in what happened in April, right? Where there was almost like a food fight and people said the Shake Shacks of the world, uh, Shake Shack, not a member of uh, the National Restaurant Association. Yeah, the Shake Shack is doing. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so they got it. And like our local coffee shops and our, our local eateries didn't. Um, that was not good for anyone. And in this bill, for the employers with 10 or less full time employees, if you're looking for a second draw, if it took you way too long, to get your first loan and it was super stressful because Congress had to go back to the well and pass a second appropriation so you could get it by like May 1st. Well, in this bill, there's $25 billion, 25 B, 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 billion with a B for second draw PPP loans for smaller borrowers with 10 or fewer employees. So 25 billion saying, give it to smaller businesses that are applying. Um, if you didn't receive a PPP loan in the first round, there's 35 billion set aside, uh, 15 billion specifically for those smallest, uh, re those smallest businesses with 10 or fewer employees. Uh, this is available all for the first 25 days, so the first three weeks of when the program's open. Um, this is not in that document. I had to pull this out for, <laughs> for a webinar we're, we're doing um, with the association tomorrow. So I was that, that was a fun morning project. Aaron, but, when, I know funds can flow in January. When do we think this reapplication process so people can get their stuff together? When is that going to happen? Early January? Because I know that 25 day window, we're going to want people to get in line quickly. Yeah, uh, I, I would say January. It, it's it's going to be, I don't think you're going to see anything other than paperwork flying around this month. Um, I would I would expect the first two weeks of January, that we're going to get a lot of information on this. Um, January 4th is when the next session of Congress gavels together. I, I think they're sworn in on January 3rd. And the first thing we're, they're gonna hear is, especially the new members, be like, let's talk about PPP <laughs> because uh, we're gonna be talking about this for the next Congress as well. Perfect. Yeah, and I just wanna emphasize what Emily said about local banks. Every local lender we've talked to, those are the ones who are really taking on this work and working with smaller operators. So, you know, if your lender's not going to participate again, or you need a new lender, go ahead and start, you know, doing that research. And as Aaron said, you know, the incentives are much stronger this time for them to participate. We have that streamlined loan forgiveness. We have more rules of the road, right? Hopefully the rules won't be changing six months afterward, like the first round. Um, so I'd really encourage you to, to look for your community lenders. And as Emily said, we'll do some work to kind of help guide you in that direction as well. They've been amazing. Yeah. And send them this document, right? Like I, I, I was <clears throat> surprised and so many small restaurants were educating their local lenders on the program. So send them this document saying, hey, this passed last night. Let's set up a conversation to talk about, you know, this is the quarter that we're using to compare gross receipts yeah. lots of 25%. This is what we're going to be doing. So by the time you're, you're talking that, that conversation about the, you know, the, the portals are open, we're ready to apply by the first week or two of January, you kind of already know that you're ready, you're eligible, and your lender is that much more familiar with the program because they might have they, they might have gotten an alert from their local advocacy group. They might have shuffled it into a folder that says 2021, and, but you're, you can get the ball rolling. Okay, I know we've got a little bit of time left. I want to dive into a couple more questions. One, um, did anything change in terms of the um, 
I guess it was like a waiver um, for people who payroll, their number, their number of FTEs decreased because of COVID and they couldn't, they weren't able to rehire them back, but they were still given uh, protection on the forgiveness side. Is that still in place for round two? Yes. Great. And then we get this question a lot. Uh, paid sick leave, that was from the Family First Act, not the CARES Act. What, if anything, carries over into 2021 on both the requirement to provide COVID leave and the tax deduction to offset the cost? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to pull this up right now because I did, I did see something like this last night. Yep. Um, Aaron, I think what you told me is the mandate goes away at the end of 2020, but you can still claim the deduction in 2021. Is that right? I thought it was March of 2021. So let me, let me read uh, this real quick. There is an extension of the paid leave credits. The mandate goes away, but the paid leave credits, I believe, are still in this final agreement that passed last night. The bill extends the refundable payroll tax credits for paid sick and family leave that were established in the Family's First Coronavirus Response Act through March 31st, 2021. Yep. So Q1 of next year, you can still access paid leave credits. And, and Eric, it's really important because our restaurants no longer as of January 1st have to provide the benefit to employees related to COVID, but they can still take the tax credit, which almost gives them incentive to do that, right? But the mandate is gone. Right. Yep, okay, that's super important. And we'll, and we'll clarify again, but that sort of was my understanding too, was Q1, and which I think is a great benefit. We've used it at our own organization, right? I think it's a great benefit. So, but having the mandate go away is also an important. So we'll get something, a separate a piece out to all of our members as this all unfolds, but, great. and that's good news. Kelsey, anything else? And if not, I'm gonna jump through the other pieces of this. I think we've covered most of, of this. There's a few more technical questions that I'll talk to Aaron about offline and, and we'll get back to folks. And as Joe shared, we're gonna share this three pager through all of our channels as well. So I think that's the major questions for now. Emily, why don't we dig into the, yeah. the last details of the bill? Yeah, and I think you know PPP and deductibility is what's really stood out, um, obviously where we're gonna spend our time, but also don't wanna lose sight that there were other pieces of this bill, this legislation that um, is helpful right now. And the first, of course, is the employee retention tax credits. Aaron, I don't know if you want to speak to that. Yeah, this is something I'm actually pretty jazzed up about, as jazzed up as you can get about tax policy. <clears throat> so when Congress passed ERTC and PPP in the CARES Act in March, ERTC became like the redheaded stepchild that like wasn't like embraced by restaurants because they put in a provision that said you can't do both in the same year. Again, they thought it was like a, a three month problem. It turned out to be like, it's gonna be a three year problem. But <clears throat> we worked really hard to say, give us ERTC for Q4 for, for at least that last three months. Restaurants can qualify if they're under partial closure orders, not even losses, just show me partial closure orders. And what they did is they said, okay, you can't take tax credits to pay payroll that was funded by PPP, but now you can use PPP and ERTC. So I'm I'm gonna I'm going to uh, get more regulatory guidance on this. But in my mind, if your PPP payroll ended the last week of September, you could qualify for employee retention tax credits for your for your staff October, November, December. That's and my so for, me, yeah. so for me. I'm thinking like you can you can go PPP for most of 2020, take tax credits up to seven grand, either five yeah. grand or seven grand. I'm gonna seven grand. Oh, I'm seven. sorry, it's five grand. It's seven grand for the first two quarters of 2021. Correct. And then it's five up to five grand for Q4 these, these past three months. So I'm thinking to myself when I, when I see that, if you're allowing them to align take the tax credit for Q4 for all your employees that you have these yep. past three months and then get your PPP in January. Mm -hmm. um, so that was something that I was hoping for. And like we were talking to the tax folks who weren't leading on this relief effort. It was really more of a small business appropriations act, uh, but we got that language in there. And so in my, in my mind, like I'm gonna have to ask this question 10 different ways to people with a lot of initials behind their name, no offense, Emily. <laughs> but people that like really know this stuff because I'm excited at potentially getting $5,000 per employee of tax credits 
for restaurants in October, November, December, and then getting another PPP in January. Yep. I think that makes sense because you all are still paying the paychecks when you're operating under the crazy. That's right. You ever have. That may be the best advice on the call, right? Because you're stacking them. You're essentially saying, and I know we took advantage of the employee region tax credit just in the association this summer, right? Because we didn't qualify at the time for any, any kind of relief as a nonprofit. Um, so that, that is a big one. And knowing, I want to make sure, and we get to a couple more of these, which is the work opportunity tax credit that exists today. It extends it for five years. There are specific categories. If you hire, train, and then retain these employees, um, there is a tax credit. So that's gone on for another five years. Mm -hmm. uh, something that we lobbied hard for too is business meals um, are now 100% deductible for two more years. So for two years, the deductibility was brought back on business meals. Why does that matter? Well, we want people, business people dining out again, right? Having sales events, having customer dinners, all of that. Now this business meals actually will be a significant driver, I think, as companies start to re-engage their workforce, as the vaccine does its job, um, that's going to be good. And then, of course, you can imagine that in two years' time is something we'll lobby very hard for to make permanent. And I'll also, I'll also say we've, we've taken uh, the Wall Street Journal editorial board said that this was not great policy. And you know what? Like, was it one of our top priorities? No. But when they said we have a tax credit to help largely full-service restaurants for 2021 and 2022, and one of your friends is a server or a bartender or a host or hostess at one of these full service restaurants, you better believe that that's a big deal for keeping their jobs and keeping their local economies doing well. That more business meals are being encouraged uh, to go to these restaurants and help, helping this workforce. Um, I see it as a workforce bill uh, more than I do seeing it as like a, a three martini lunch bill, which I don't think anyone really can do anymore. <laughs> I also think, you know, it's through, it's 2021 and 2022, and we have to remember this is going to be a long, gradual recovery, and I think this is maybe really Congress's first kind of acknowledgement that they get that, right, that this is going to be a long road, and we're going to need lots of solutions, not just the immediate sort of cash on hand um, issue, which we know is critical too. And then we go and we talked about the SBA, right? And so, and I know we feel a lot of questions from folks that have outstanding SBA loans, they have disaster loans, they, there's all sorts of different loans out there, but the loan programs also were enhanced. I think the last one is probably most valuable to me is loans taken out prior to the CARES Act. There's going to allow three additional months of principal and interest, but then restaurants are authorized to take five additional after that three. Um, and so I think it just, it's again, it's like extending that runway out into us. It's all about cash flow. It's why at this, I mean, this is all federal. You can imagine what we're working at the state level um, that Kelsey's so knee deep in, which is one of our goals is to preserve as much cash as possible to allow all of you to operate, right? Anytime we can take off fees or, you know, restrictions or putting like the tax deductibility money you don't have to put out, that's another day that you can stay in business. Um, and so I think this is these SBA, especially no fees for the 504, um, extending the principal interest waiver for all new and existing 7A, 504 and micro loans. And so for a lot of you, you have these loans as well over the last couple of years. So make sure to dig into this. We'll send this out now. And of course, like we did the last time, you'll start getting lots of nightly updates with all the clarifications you need. So follow those emails really closely. Um, but I don't want you to think that the SBA also wasn't included because there's some nice enhancements for you guys as well. Kelsey, anything else on the chat? And we got five minutes left. We're getting quite a few questions, Aaron, on the um, $10,000, I guess it was the IDLE grant and, mm -hmm. and that getting repaid. I think we're gonna have to talk about that offline because it just gets technical pretty quickly, but mm -hmm. just know that we are getting a lot of people ask that. It sounds like a lot of people were kind of hit by that in round one. Um, so it's great we got that fixed. I'm gonna throw, the, uh, I'm gonna throw some of the information in the chat box and, the, and a link uh, to that. Perfect, thank you. That's great. Um, I think we've covered most of this. Well, here's one question we didn't get to. So if you, uh, if you did have to reduce your, your FTE count and you qualify for that hold harmless provision, that's the word I was trying to think of earlier, uh, can you still use the simplified, uh, streamline loan forgiveness application if you're under that 150,000 mark? I'm sorry, what was, what was the first part? If you're using the hold harmless provision because your FTE count dropped, but oh, your loan yeah, is, yeah. Can, can you still use the streamline harbor. application? If, so if you're, a, if you're using the safe harbor provision number one that says, I couldn't rehire all my staff, therefore don't 
don't hit my loan forgiveness amount. Right. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. I think so. I, I don't think there's a restriction. It's based on loan, on loan size. It's based on loan size, which is 150,000 or less. And it's a safe harbor, not a dangerous harbor. It's a right. Yeah. And that's probably one. <laughs> the best line yet, Aaron. I love that. Um, yeah, and, and we'll watch that issue closely. I'm sure there will be some rules and, and some guidelines with the new application, but we expect so. Um, let's see, two more. To confirm for single member LLC owners with multiple entities, the max per entity is $2 million. This is for PPP round two. Does this mean that we are okay with multiple separate entities for $2 million each? Did that make sense, Aaron? They're kind of trying to figure out the, how the affiliation rule works with the $2 million loan cap. So yeah, th this is a good question. And there, there are two ways to answer it. Uh, I just want to make sure uh, I'm going to give the best information. And again, we're, we're unpacking this as we go. Um, we're learning how to, how to land the plane as we fly the plane. But <laughs> all single member LLC owners of multiple entities so if you have if you have one LLC and everyone is under your umbrella because you have multiple entities, then that means all of your entities and your that operate under your LLC are qualified for one two million dollar loan. If you have, and I'm not sure about the tax structure, but if you have like a corporate group, but everyone has their own tax ID numbers, we we do think that there's a cap for that. Treasury put out a regulation in May that said a they called it a single corporate group. And they said there's a $20 million cap for one single corporate group at 20 million. It was poorly defined. Um, honestly, we, we, did, we didn't see it. Uh, a member brought it to us. And we're going to have to ask for that cap to be extended. If you, if you have many different entities under a larger umbrella, um, but there is a larger, there, there may be a larger single corporate group cap out there that is undefined as of now. Okay, so more to come on that. Um, I think we've covered it. This has been incredibly, incredibly helpful. I just want to reiterate again that this is a down payment. It's, it's a big down payment. It's a big step in the right direction. It's going to help many of our members literally survive the winter, um, but we need more. And uh, all three of us on this call are very aware of that. And that's why we're going to be calling on Congress and calling on our members and calling on our advocates and stakeholders to, to continue fighting with us until we get the relief we need. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Emily for closing yeah. thoughts. Yeah, thank you, Kelsey and Aaron. And Aaron, thank you, because I know you've just lived this and um, so much of the work you did helped us get this over the line. Um, I think Kelsey's comments are, are perfect. And I also want to make sure we don't forget about state and local. And so we are very knee deep in this federal relief. At the same time, we're in a state where just yesterday, Governor Abbott reiterated one more time, there will be no more lockdowns in Texas. Um, I think that's incredibly important because it gives you some reassurance. At the same time, the vaccine is rolling out um, across Texas very aggressively. We, uh, the CDC yesterday recommended um, that we be in that third round as food service workers. We know that guidance will be important to Governor Abbott as he makes his decision. But, you know, but this sort of building trust and getting people back out and moving again, whether you take the vaccine or not, that's a personal choice. But having that option is going to get people back out moving again. And so the really most important part of this is there's no single silver bullet to save the restaurant industry. There's not one thing that's going to happen to change your life. It's going to be all these things coming together. So it's getting a great legislative session at the state level, which we're working hard on. It's getting this relief bill over the line. It's building the relationships on our congressional leadership side where they know that come the new year, we're going to have to do something. It doesn't have to be $900 billion, but there needs to be a targeted effort to help restaurants. And so I think what I want you to know is just to walk away knowing we're going to get through this this round. It is something to be very thankful for, and we'll already start dialing it up again for the for, for the next year. But but I can tell you, working with the lobby team in D.C., that they are even like us surprised at how much we were able to get out of this in such a divided partisan Congress. And so I think we take that, we move forward, make it better. We'll continue to provide updates to all of you. Uh, please stay on top of the newsletters because as guidance comes out, Aaron and others on that team are the ones who dig into it and digest it for you. And so as, as he said, we found many times that we were the ones as the TRA and NRI educating the folks you were going to talk to about all of your um, uh, you know, business, finance, and legal. And so we'll continue to play that role as long as you know it's not binding or official or legal. <laughs> um, so Aaron, thank you. Kelsey, uh, all the team behind the scenes, thank you so much. We'll post this. 
And right now we're gonna drop this um, three page document uh, into our uh, member uh, distribution list. And so you guys should have that in the next 30 minutes. Print it off, look at it and go find that lender and have that discussion now. Good. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Aaron, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Happy holidays. Happy holidays, guys. Take care.